Talk about a professional. Talk you about, know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Shout out to, hey man, Michael, this is my, this is my homeboy slash assistant slash producer, Lee. What's How you up, doing? Lee? What's going on, my man? Nice to meet you. Nice uh, to meet you too. You need to get your boy a new setup. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you, like, you know, I mean, this dude, what well, he got? He got, he got his name behind him and you can't even see his name. All you, it's like ridiculous. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> what is his head supposed to fit in the middle of his name? Is That's that, right. Is that, oh, okay. The problem, when we got him to sign, it did fit, but over time it got bigger. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, called, I can see that. It's called ego. <laughs> it's, mm. called, it's called having too much money in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and from Network TV. But, but, but I love it. Like, Justin got all this money, and I'm the one with the nice podcast studio. Come on now. Hey man, but Come see, on, man. hey man, that's why I wanted to have you on, man, because I, I created. Because I'm broke. Because I'm huh? broke. No, no, no. You is not broke. Man, <laughs> no one believes this, man. His microphone costs more than my entire apartment. I'm sure. Yo, Michael, yo. Uh, the reason I created this uh this platform, man, I've been wanting to do it for two years. I finally had time to do it, and I wanted to like celebrate people that I mm -hmm. feel are living legends and people making legendary moves in their career. That's why I named the Urban Legends Podcast. Um, and man, you somebody that I've seen for years, constantly, constantly working. That's how I know you got money. You ain't <laughs> never not had a job. <laughs> That's right. You know me, you know how we roll up here. Nah, man, it's, it's a thing where I met you from entertainment news. I was an entertainment reporter and then comedy started to take off for me. So I decided just to focus on comedy and I decided to act. Now I'm in your world where you know, later on today, I got a big audition. So now it's funny that if you can do comedy, casting directors are like, yo, that's the hardest thing to do with stand-up comedy. You can act. You know what I mean? Like, I go to every casting office, and the difference from being a host and a comedian is when I used to go into those castings, they were like, oh, you're a host. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ask you about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But now it's like, oh, I saw you at the Laugh Factory. I saw you at the Comedy Store. Saw... So they already know what you can bring. They saw clips of you. So it's just a different level. You know what I mean? How long did it take you for you to start getting consistently good when it comes to stand up? Or was it something that clicked immediately? It clicked immediately, but because I, I think because I was on radio and I did TV for so long, you know, the biggest part of stand-up is people liking you on stage and being comfortable. Straight and up. I was already comfortable. I just needed better material. You know what I mean? So <laughs> <laughs> what were you talking about in the beginning? You know, one thing, and Joe Coy's my mentor, he gave me props because I came out the gate talking about family, my family. And most comedians start with like Tinder, whatever is going on. It, ob more observation. Oh, well, Where, I still have plenty of dick jokes in case anybody yeah, want to use any yeah. of mine. I got something to give yeah, away. Justin got dick jokes for days, all right? <laughs> no, nah. but, it, but it's a thing It's a thing where uh, I started with family stories because Joe was my mentor and he goes, your family is crazy. I met them. The stories are crazy. You're always telling me about them. So start with that. So Joe said it took him 10 years to get to that point where he could talk about his family. I started out. So kind of like I just evolved into being better at it. You know what I mean? That's fire. Well, it's very smart of you to, to know that. I mean, that's what Kevin Hart said when he started getting into stand-up. And he knew the family material is what started really clicking for him. And that's when he started to see his audience grow, which I'm sure you already know. You know, you know why that is? It's because people, I remember when I first started, people go, well, how is people going to relate to your family? If you tell a story good, my mom says whatever pops into her head. But guess what? A lot of people have people in their family that do that. And so it, it might not be their mom, but it'll relate to somebody in their family. People always try to make it Asian, Black, this, that. No, family is family. And we all got the same characters in our families, just maybe different people too, you know? No, I agree. Absolutely. I agree a thousand percent, man. Um, that's something I try to keep in mind. Um, man, I, I want to I wanna go back to the beginning, man, with you because, you know, I think it's so dope. I remember the first time I saw you perform, it probably was like at the Ha Ha or somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, I didn't know he did stand up. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was no, just... but that's what a lot of people think. That's what, you know what? I'm still, 
until a year and a half ago when I made a conscious effort to all my social media, just comedy. I took down all my hosting stuff where now I think my ticket sales are growing so much because people go, oh, he's a comic now. You know what I mean? Where before I was kind of juggling both and no one really saw me as a comedian because people come to my show just like you go, you know what? We didn't even know you did comedy. We just saw you on the Wendy Williams show. You know, it's just like, so it's kind of grown into that. And that's so smart that you, man, I keep battling with that because man, I, I suffer from that problem when it comes to like MacGyver fans. Like mm -hmm. they they only want to, they only support the MacGyver stuff. A lot of them. There's a few very very small percentage that support my other stuff. But for the most part, if it's not MacGyver related, they not interested in it. And it had got to a point where I was like, I think I'm finna just stop posting MacGyver shit. I need to just take down MacGyver stuff because I need to build a genuine Justin Hires fan base and not a Bozer and MacGyver fan base. You know what's crazy, and this is being on a couple of different TV shows. I've had friends on sitcoms, though. Still, they didn't come out to see him perform. You know, but when I was on, but Chelsea, it's certain shows. Chelsea Lately in her prime, literally, I started comedy at Chelsea Lately. Started. I would bring four comics, put myself in the middle. I had 10 to 15 minutes, that's it, right? Selling out shows because... For some reason, every comedy fan watched Chelsea lately. That's true. Where in other shows, if you don't really play yourself, right? Then people don't because if they, for instance, if it's the Justin Hires sitcom, and you play yourself, coming people soon. will come out to your stand up. Coming soon, <laughs> people will come out to your stand up. Like Keenan, by the way, if he did stand up, people will come, because they know him. I feel that in acting. And I've had tons of friends in shows, but it doesn't relate to ticket sales because they're not playing themselves. Straight up. I mean, that's you great know? information because I, I was going to ask you, one of my questions was going to be, are, do you struggle with selling tickets? Um, but no, it doesn't sound like you are. It sounds like... Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not Joe Coy or Bill Burr, but I do all right. I do all right for a guy that... Biggest, you know, biggest TV credit is being on entertainment news right now, you know, but I stay relevant. I jump on Wendy Williams, love her, you know, but it's entertainment. I just do her entertainment news and we shoot the stuff, but it's a thing for not ever being on like a sitcom, a TV show or anything like that. I do really well. I'm just now at the point you were, what, probably six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just looking for my, we always feel like we that one pop away. Straight up. Because we, probably, are. You, because we are. Because we are. Because we're we're both relevant in the industry where we get calls. It's just the right project. You got MacGyver, and when you first got it, you're like, oh, yo, this is going to blow up. Which, it, hey, you made your money. It's going to get syndicated. I made my money, yeah. It, it, it blew. I don't know if it blew, blew up, but. <laughs> no, but, but, but you did well, you know. Right. You, you did a lot more than I have on the TV side. Right. But while you were doing that, I've been getting my chops in order. It's like, you know, my stand-up's been getting stronger and stronger. I'm at the, I live in, a, in Las Vegas now. That's I've crazy. Been going, I've been going up at the cell. I'm going up starting tonight, 34 days in a row, 68 shows in a row, trying to get my new special together. I'm going to shoot in November. It's like I'm addicted and it's growing. It's, it's, it feels so good because I know that TV show is going to come. Something's going to come. And, but as far as stand up, if I get a call, like I want to be ready. I want to be when they say, hey, you on a show with Bill Burr, this, this, I want to destroy where these people are like, yo, this dude's for real, you know? No, nah, absolutely. Man, when did the, the comedy bug really like kick in for you? When as did soon as I got off stage the first time. Miami Improv that? 2012 mm -hmm. was my first show ever. I was supposed to do three minutes. I did 15. I didn't know. I just got lost. I, I blacked out. I blacked out. I, I did 15 minutes. Did, like, I still, uh, Orlando Labor, he's a comedian. He has it on tape. And I saw it not too long ago, and it's not bad. I did a lot of crowd work. I did me, you know, because I wasn't scared to be on stage. And as soon as I got off stage, I called my mom. I was like, yo, this is what I was born to do. I love it, man. I love it. Love it. Me too, man. Do you know who Jack Thriller is? You know, no, Jack, he uh, he was mm -hmm. a host for like this is fifty. It was Fifty Cent's uh, website mm -hmm. that was super popular back in the day. 
Um, but he he just saw me at the Atlanta Comedy Theater I was hosting since I, I got a spot out here because this is where we was filming MacGyver at. And um, he was like, man, you on T, you act. Like, why are you still doing stand-up? Like, you did it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, man, I love it. Like, I love stand-up at the end of the day. It's like, that's that's what I love doing. And, and also, when TV's not around, i.e. Yeah. MacGyver just got canceled, <laughs> when TV's not around, you know, you have these, you can go in and perform, get money, and work on your craft, you know, so that's why I'm still- You know, and, and that's the thing is, I remember talking to Arsenio Hall, and he was like, man, I wish I would have kept doing stand-up right after Arsenio Hall's show. Because it's something, here's the thing, those are your people. It's kind of like if you have a big podcast, and whoever listens to it, whether it's 200 people or 2 million people, those are your people. Those are your ride or dies. Straight up. They will come to your show. They will buy your merch. They will support you. And that's what we're all trying to build. You know, MacGyver for you is just another step. Me doing little projects here, it's just another step because we all get that little step and then you'll get a big one. And then it'll slow down and you have a bunch of little steps. So it's just that I've, I have so many friends that have done that for a lot longer than me but now are popping. I'm just trying to do it in half the time. You know right what I mean? So, I feel you. I, feel I don't want to be 80 and finally make it like, hey, I made it, you know? Man, that, that used to be one of my fears because I always thought I was going to pop it like 20, 21, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And I kind of, it's so funny. You don't know this story about me. I was a video jockey for MTVU senior year in college. I went to college, oh Clark, Atlantic, Clark Atlanta University. MTVU was doing like, there was they had something called the Woody Awards. It's like their version of the VMAs, but for college students. But like real like celebrity musicians be there at the award show. Anyways, they came, I had a radio show in college. They wanted to like document like these different radio stations. Uh, these kids at radio stations talking about the Woody Awards. And I was super funny that day. MTV was like, yo, we want to hire you as a video jockey. They flew me down to Cancun. They, they had me at, present at the award show, all of this stuff, right? Oh, wow. I'm 20 years old, senior year. They offered me a full-time contract to be a video jockey with MTV for MTVU to fly up to New York and, and be a video jockey for them for five years. This was 2007. I turned it down. <laughs> Why'd you do that? Because, and this is exactly, I'm bringing this up because you host so much. Um, at that time in 2007, I felt like people was putting everybody in boxes. It wasn't how it is now. You see, yes. you could do anything now. You could be a host, stand-up comedian, host a game show, go act in a movie. But in 2007, it was like, if you was a host, you was Terrence J. You know? You were a host. Yeah, a host. that's right. And so I was like, well, yo, am I going to be able to do any acting? Because my whole dream growing up was I wanted to move to L.A. to pursue acting. Now here goes MTV saying we want to move you to New York and host. And so I was like, am I going to be able to do any movies? So I was like, well, we'll give you like six weeks in the summertime. And I'm like, who the fuck am I? Like, I'm going to be able to call a production company and be like, yo, I'm yeah. available for six weeks in the summer. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not Denzel. So I was like, I turned it down. I, uh, most people thought I was fucking crazy. Uh, and I said, you know, I'm going to pursue my acting and stand up in L.A. And I went and moved to L.A. and, you know, got my, my acting. Um, so How long did it take for you to pop, though, get your first thing in L.A.? Man, I'm not even going to lie to you. My first day there, I booked the TV show. <laughs> oh, God damn. <laughs> Man, I, I want to punch you in the face right now. You know that? But, I just want to you know, punch you in the face. But, but I got something that's even worse when you hear stories like that. Ashton Kusher, Ashton Kusher and Topher Grace, their first audition was that 70s show. Oh, my goodness. Well, one, I think Ashton Kusher, that was his first audition. I think Topher Grace, that might have been his first audition, too, or you know, you know something what's crazy. Like that. Yeah. You know what's crazy? Kristen, uh, Kristen Bell has a story like that. She moved here and got booked on that Buffy show. That's crazy. Yeah, and so she's I, worked ever since. But you know what? That being said, I still had odd jobs when I first moved out there. It wasn't, and I did like little commercials and, and, and you know, MTV prank shows. It wasn't until um, Rush Hour where I felt like, okay, like I kind of arrived at least in the industry, kind of really know who I'm starting to be. How did it feel when Rush Hour didn't work? Man, 
You Did you think it was over? Did you think it was over? No, but my 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 representation thought it was over. And I'm oh, not gonna, really? I'm not gonna let you flip this interview on me, Michael. Yo, <laughs> I'm not gonna let you do it. But I'm gonna tell you <laughs> because you know what's great about talking with you. I'm like you in media, so it's a good back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I like it because I actually graduated uh, for mass communication, radio, TV, and film. So this is what I thought. I didn't think it was over. My representation at the time thought it was over to the point they basically let me go a couple, maybe a week or two after the show got canceled. Wow. CBS offered me MacGyver a week after my representation let me go. So those stupid fucks <laughs> didn't get any of that MacGyver money because they thought, oh, well, it didn't work. Justin, what, what, what agency was that? I'm not going to say. Okay. They're, they're pieces of shit and they know it. Uh, okay. But shout out to all the people. Who, who are you with? Uh, I'm with William Morris. Okay, so you're not with them. So you're good. If you was with them, I would have been like, I'll talk to you offline. Um, <laughs> so that being said, that being said, I knew Rush Hour. Wait, wait, I'm not done with this. Did they try to call you and get you back? No, after of they course, heard? No, of course not. I mean, they wouldn't do that, you yeah. know? They wouldn't do that. Um, but I know they read Deadline and Hollywood Reporter. It was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about MacGyver was it was already picked up when I came on yeah. board. So mm -hmm. meaning, but and it what but the show hadn't start yet. So they had shot a pilot. CBS didn't like the original pilot, but they knew it was such a heavy IP intellectual property for anybody listening that don't know. They knew that. So they was like, well, we still go put it on the air anyways. So they was like, but we going to reshoot the pilot. So I got brought in after CBS was like, we going to reshoot the pilot. Let's get some other actors. Hey, Justin, do you want to hop on this MacGyver uh, show? Because, you know, it's already picked up. Mm -hmm. So, but this is what I was going to say about that. Um, damn, what, what I was about to say, what was my last point about, about MacGyver? Um, they I don't know, Justin. They didn't believe, but I did. Oh, here it goes. The final point. Uh -huh. I knew the show wasn't mine, right? Meaning, I didn't have creative control. I didn't get to say whatever I wanted to say. I wasn't involved in the writing. I got to do a little improv here and there. So I was like, once I get something that's mine, um, where I'm the executive producer, I'm the writer, I really could pick the music and all type of stuff like that, I know it's gonna be a success. I haven't had my Atlanta or my Insecure. Yeah. You see what I'm I saying? I, I haven't had that yet. Now, but in the moment, I'm going to tell you, because I think this was your original, original question. I felt like I had slipped down a mountain <laughs> because meaning you work, you work, you work, your work, you work to get your own TV show, right? And you're like, damn, I'm finally the star of a TV show. I'm like, man, I do this show five years. I'm out of here. You know, like, you couldn't tell me. I'm like, I'm finna get booked at all the clubs. I, and I even started seeing it. The clubs was booking me. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yo, we do five seasons of Rush Hour. It's a wrap. I'm going to do this shit. Then I'm going to move over, over to the movies. And I'm out of here. And then fucking episode 13, you find out you cancel. And you like, fuck. <laughs> so, like, you climbing. You at the mountaintop. You're like, no. Yep. Like, fucking, like, you falling off the cliff. Um but and then it, it restarts with MacGyver. And then it restarts with MacGyver, man. And even with MacGyver, though, for me, this is just me personally. I never saw, I always looked at MacGyver as my community. Like what Donald Glover was to community, yep. I saw that's what MacGyver was for me. Um, and, you know, but I'm sure your fans are like, Justin, shut the fuck up, man. No. We came here for Michael Yo. No, 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 no. It's it's back and forth, man. I'm I I it's like two black people that uh television hires is Justin hires and Tone Bell. That's <laughs> y'all no, got no, no. it on Tone on the gets lot. hired way more than me. I work more consistently on one project. Yes. But, but Tone gets fired from more projects. Than anybody. Been His shows fired. never get picked up. But yeah. I love him. I love him. Hey man, we I I talk, I had him on, on this podcast and we talked about it, man. You know, about about the many cancellations he's has, man. But I told him he's one of those people that's like 
I don't know, a, a Jennifer Aniston, a, a, a Dave Chappelle. You know how they was involved with all these other shows yep. and stuff like that. And then there's eventually going to be a project that he's going to be a part of that's going to hit and he's going to be set for life. No, what, what I'm telling you, Tone's going to be the first one of us to win an Oscar. He will win an Oscar. I'll like see, the I first one. I see it. Like all these failures, and they're not failures, all these, you know, missed projects. Mm -hmm. He's going to get the big one. I mean, he was close. He was hand in hand with a person that won like, like a bunch of awards. But a Billy you know, so movie. Yeah. So it's a thing where when you're around it, you become it. And my job right now is being around great comedians because that's what I want to be first. And acting, I'm around great actors. So, you know, Tone helps me out at times. And I got great coaches. And it's a thing where you just see it, man. I, I don't know. It's hard. Like, I've already seen the end of this movie. And I know, I know I'm going to be a huge stand-up comic. And I know I've already seen, It's so crazy how confident I am. And it's not cocky. It's just I'm like this to myself. I just already seen this end of this movie. I'm going to be in the next year. Year and a half, I'm going to get booked on a TV show, but that TV show is going to fit me. And it's God's plan, man. Look, I almost died last year. So it's a thing where I'm here for a reason. Straight you up. know what I mean? And I think it's to spread love, it's to spread knowledge, and it's to make people laugh. Straight, hey, man, everything you just said is, man, I believe you a thousand percent. Mm -hmm about your success, your trajectory, your career. That's why I wanted to have you on the on the podcast yeah. because I believe in you, man. And that's something – I was just talking to Henry Winkler on, on here. I had Henry, you, you know, the fines, right? And, oh, yeah. You're you just dropping names on me now. Yeah, oh, you know, Henry Winkler. Yeah, hey, but you know what's so funny? You've interviewed every big celebrity, oh, yeah. you know, in, in, that we can imagine. But he was saying the same thing about – because I, he, he, I was telling him what I wanted next for myself. And he was like, it's all about manifestation, man. It's about speaking it and getting it, you know? So that's why I know everything that you're saying is going to come true because you're clearing your vision, you're clearing your purpose, and, and it's going to happen, period. That, and that's, what, that's the mindset you got to keep. Like, you know, like, even when I miss out on a project, like, there was this big audition, man, and I didn't get it. But in my mind... It? I can't say because they haven't, they have, it hasn't come out, but mm. it was big. It was really big. And it was that moment where I'm young in my acting career, but when I got it, that means eyes are on you. You like, this was no like random cat. Like they were like, okay, we want these five people to come in for this. Oh, nice. and it was big. I didn't get it, but you know, people got eyes on you now and you know, your, your tapes have been good because those same casting directors keep reaching out. They want, they want to get you in that, in that right project. But when I, my mindset is when I don't get a project, Oh, that's because I was going to book something better and it's supposed to take that time space. You know what I mean? Or something better is coming. So that's how my mind, like I never, my, I think if we in our mind never lose, you know, just don't take it as a loss. Straight up. Just take it out. Oh, it's not the right opportunity. Hey, man, you know, something I, I really told myself last year was to really live in, you know, rejection is God's protection. Yeah. And anything that doesn't go my way, anything that seems like an obstacle is, is pushing me and guiding me to where I'm ultimately meant to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's how I started really, you know, taking like any type of thing, anything that's quote unquote a failure, nothing but experiences and, and, and learning lessons as I see them. Um, but that's how I really started to use that. Um, but yeah, man. I love that. Rejection is God's protect. I love that, man. I yeah. love that. Nah, straight up, man. This is what I wanted to know. So you black and Korean. Um, do you feel like, and I don't know. Let me know. I, this is a, I don't know how this no, works. No, bring it, bring it, bring it. <laughs> Do you feel like the Asian community support you or the black community support you when it comes to like your shows, when it comes to stand up? Or do you feel like you have like a multiracial, like, or you see what I'm saying? Or, or no, no, no. I, I, yeah. I, I think at different points in my career, the comedy has skewed one way or the other. I think just now, it's becoming right down the middle where 
like my comedy at first was all about my dad. And then a couple of years later, it became about my mom. And now I think it's the, like I'm shooting this special in December, I mean in November, it's the first time it's balanced and both of them look powerful. Nice. I remember when I first, I remember when my mom was more prevalent than my dad, black people would get mad at me at the end of the show, just go, yo, your dad got a PhD and you didn't really talk about it. Mm. Cause all the jokes were with my mom because my mom says the crazy stuff. So that made me dig deeper and go, what makes this man so great? And what makes him funny? So that's where I, I turned the camera on me. It was like, started self-evaluating like, okay. Cause I, at all times I make both characters fail, right. but, at, but they also need to look strong too. And I think I've mastered that in this new material I got. And it's a lot about me and them rather than just them and me reacting to them. So it, it's, uh, it's grown definitely. But at the beginning, you know, I did have black people get mad because my dad wasn't represented as much. And then when I started representing my dad more, Asian people get mad. So it's this balance where even now, because I do so many sets, I may do a set where I'm just making fun of my mom because she says crazy things. So if you're Asian and you see that set, you're like, oh, you just poke fun at your mom all the time. Mm. But you haven't heard my whole set. Right. You heard 15, 10 minutes of it. It's a long set. So to all the people that come to shows, to any comic, if you see them perform in a club, that is not a final draft. That is their first draft. Right. Until a it's, draft. it's a rough draft. That's like a reporter writing a review on somebody's rough draft and that reporter turning in his, his little cheat notes right. and say, here's a print this. He's not going to do that. He's going to write it up. He's gonna, it's going to go to somebody to look at. Then that person's going to get spell check. There's so many processes, processes to it getting printed. You know what I mean? So whenever you see a comic in a club, we working it out. We're trying it out. Now, when you see it on a special, then you can, then you can like Judging criticize great. it or do whatever you want to do with it. But don't don't say don't say nothing to me in a club, you know. Yeah, you heard what he said. Y'all heard what Michael Yo said. You don't say nothing to me. I'm six two. I will crush you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's a big dude. <laughs> Make no mistake. <laughs> I'm guessing that's the black in you. Oh uh, yeah. Well, yeah. my mom's five ten. My mom's taller than you. So shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, if anybody don't know, I have the body of a toddler. Uh, <laughs> how anybody, tall are you? Like how tall are you? Like five three? I'm five. I'm five six. I'm <laughs> oh, taller. <laughs> Thank you very much. Not gonna take away my inches. Taller than Kevin Hart. Damn it. Are you Are you taller than Kevin Hart? Nah, I seriously, am. He's oh, wow. so little, and I'm not even joking. He's so little that when he walks in a room that I'm in, I'm like, God, God damn, you short. Like, because he's five <laughs> four and a half. Oh wow! And that yeah. inch and a half make a big difference, huh? What can I say? <laughs> but hey man uh his his uh wallet is taller than mine okay yes, so 100 <laughs> percent. yeah y'all should do a movie together call it shorties well i want to i want to do a movie called napoleon complex i wanted to, i used to want to do That's a stand-up comedy tour this is my idea and of course i was always the least famous i wanted to do me kevin hart cat williams and lil duvall and have it a tour called napoleon complex um oh that's I'm, great yeah but i'm you know so so i gotta ask you one more question yeah go for it You've been on all these shows. Mm -hmm. uh, people know your name. Some Does people. it frustrate you? Because uh, by the way it sounds, that you don't sell more tickets in common. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you what frustrates me. My, my agent act like he can't fucking get me booked at comedy shows. That's what frustrates me. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the difficulty. It's like, they'll always say, well, and it's, it goes to what you said when it comes to, they'll say, well, it's MacGyver, people we don't know if people go come out because it's mm. you on MacGyver. However, I mean, I have fans at the end of the day, I'm kind of the comic relief on the show. It's a, it's a one hour drama, but it was kind of like comedy elements in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, man, anytime I've had legitimate press, like I get to do the morning shows, I get to do the radio shows, I had great turnouts, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. The, the, the press stuff makes a big difference. It's got, every station you go to, CB, CBS affiliate should pick you up in that market. Well, exactly. Um, but the, the, hold on. What, and what was your, what was your, your main question? Uh, the, the, the frustration with you being on a lot of like television 
but sometimes it doesn't translate to ticket sales. Yeah. So my yeah, anytime I had legitimate press, I I, I did well in ticket sales. Now I ain't gonna lie, yeah. if it's a if I let's say I landed, I don't know, Friday morning and I didn't get to do radio or something like that, yeah. then the ticket sales, the ticket sales don't do as well. But no, I you got know, you. but legitimately, you know, as long as I have proper press, they were fine. You know, so my thing now is like this is where I'm at on it, is building my social media yeah as much as possible right now so you know i got on TikTok in december which i didn't want to do but you know i'm doing decent on there now um and i just flooding just flooding shit with my uh, you know got two different podcasts got this i got one with my best friends um and just dropping stuff you know and just really building that up because i know when i do have a legitimate fan base i feel like along with uh the credits the tv credits it I'll kind of be hard for a comedy club to say, no, we're not going to have Justin. It's, it's, you know, what's funny is no matter what level you at, you always have to battle things. Other people don't have to battle. Isn't that crazy? Like yep. I'm sitting here listening to a dude that's going to get syndication money <laughs> and I'm going, this dude talking about getting it. Man, please, uh, I'll take the money over getting in a club. I'll book a little arena, you know, like, but, but it's funny because I talked to Tone about the same thing. You know, he's like, I'm just getting in the clubs. Like, I would bring Tone out to a bunch of clubs I did so the owners could see him. Well, you're you know, a good so, dude. Yeah. Good. So I would, if, I would if bring If you ever him need out. me, holler at me because I mean, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm out here. <laughs> he's out. He says, I'm at home. <laughs> I'm at home with a Sharpie of my name. I took a, <laughs> I took a Crayola and fucking I had my daughter draw that. All right, I'm listening, my bad. No, but but that's the thing is like, you know, I, we, I popped on his shows, he's popped on mine. So it's a thing where I look up to you guys go, man, I just want to get on TV. And then Tone's looking at me going, I just want to get in comedy clubs. You know, what you I, know, so, yep. so it's, that, it's, that, it's that give and take. And that's what I love too about the industry we hungry. hungry. So if we ain't got something, we want to get it, you know? What I realized a long time ago when I got to LA is everybody wants something that somebody else has. So I remember, I, for instance, I remember being the star of uh, Rush Hour. Yeah. King Batch came on set. And he was like, damn, man, you got the role, man. You know, everybody auditioned for, for that role. He was like, man, you got it. You got the role, man. And I'm like, shit, you know, he like, I want to be on TV. I'm like, I want 4 million followers on mine. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, but even now, like, I remember he saw me one time and he was like, dang, Justin, like, I need to get on TV like you, you working. And I'm like, bro, every video you post get two, three million views. I'm like, you don't need TV. Like, you are, your Instagram and, and you know, TikTok now is your TV. But, but you know what? You know what? That only, like everything, it only takes you so far. Yeah. You know, you need, that's what I love about comedy, like stand up. Like, it's not associated with a show, it's you. So if you pop, like I've seen Joe Coy, I've known him for 15 years. Not a dude selling out Staples Center and they, those are his people. Mm. Like, they'll never go away. My Guyver people, since it's off the air or it's going, I don't even know right now. But it's once gone. that show is done, you may have a little audience stick around for a couple months, maybe a year, but they, they forget about the show. When you pop at like a Burt Kreischer, like a Joe Rogan, like a uh, Chris D'Elia at the time before all the stuff, like those are their people, you right. know, and they're going to be there for the rest of your life as long as you don't do anything stupid. Right. Well, that's that's what I'm working on. I mean, that's literally the plan. That's what we all working on, you know? Yeah. Well, that's what I admire about you, man, because you got the, the serious SM show and um right, because that's the the uh the, Yeah, I got the serious XM show. I got I got the, the podcast. I'm about to kick off my tour. I'm calling it uh I'm still here. Nice. Cool. <laughs> you never you know, left, man. <laughs> almost died though. So that's, you know. oh, okay, that's right. So from COVID. How, what, how yeah, how about to say how how was it? I'm sure you talked about it on other other platforms, yeah. but but what was that experience like almost dying from COVID? Well, it was crazy because nobody knew really what it was. I, I was there, I was the first person at St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank in ICU with COVID. Like they didn't know what they were doing. March 17th of last year. 
I was at Gotham, 8th, 9th, and 10th, and then they closed it down on the 12th. I met about 2,000 people, no masks. We didn't know. I bring that shit home, you know, and man, it was, it was bad, man, because I got so much viral load, you know what I mean? From every, I was talking to everybody, hugging them and all, taking pictures with them, selling merch and all that stuff. So because, what, were you, what were you feeling? Like, how did it make you feel, like, physically? You know, you know what? I can't even describe it. It's the worst feeling I've ever had. It, it's almost like when my temperature got up to 104.8 in the hospital, I was like, if I could hit a button and end it right now, I might have hit it. Like, you just didn't want to be there. Like, it was that hard where you just did, you didn't want to live, man. You didn't want to live, but you pushed through it. I mean, my body was burning up. My head felt like it was going to explode. I couldn't walk. I, they had to carry me to go to the bathroom. Like, it was bad, man. I thought it was over, homie. And how, long, how long did that last? Eight, uh, that lasted four days, and I finally got out around eight, nine days later. So uh, that's why my tour is called I'm Still Here. No, that makes sense. <laughs> because I almost <laughs> wasn't. So, uh, but that's the thing, man, is that, you know, it was very cool to see people step up and people, you know, like reach out and things like that. It was, it was cool. You know, I had friends. I had friends. Because when I got better, like the sixth or seventh day, people were dropping off food to my wife because she couldn't go anywhere. Because she had, I, I gave it to her and the kids. They didn't let me know till I was okay. And my daughter was four months old and my son was three. And they beat it in one day. Oh, my God. So my wife didn't tell me when I was in the hospital. But let me tell you, when you see the goodness, we hear so much negativity about people. But when you see the goodness of people dropping off food through my ring, you know, I have my phone, so I saw it on the ring. And people dropping off groceries and stuff. man, I was crying in the hospital. Wow, you know, it's man. just, it's just in your worst time, you see people do great things, and uh, you know that that gives you hope. You know, no, absolutely, man. I I was just uh, listening to someone's podcast, and they were talking to um, Eric Andre. They was talking to Eric yeah. Andre. Uh, it might have been Conan O'Brien's podcast, but. They were saying how his prank, his his prank movie, uh, Bad Trip, which is fucking hilarious. I recommend anybody to mm -hmm. watch that on Netflix. Um, how a lot of prank stuff, you it shows like the bad in people. His movie was different because it showed the humanity in people. It showed like the goodness of, of people's heart. Um, and I mean, so I understand why you would be touched in yeah. crime because we're kind of fed negative, negative, negative through the media all the time and to see people doing good things, it, it, it touches you. Well, well, because that's what sells. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many great programs are on TV that just talk about positivity and love? None. Maybe This Is Us. That's about the only show <laughs> that, that's right. pulled that off. You know, Oprah tried it by giving away like special prizes to people. People didn't watch that. Right. You know, it's, it's people love, people love negativity and people love, people love world stars. You know, like that's what people love to see bad done to people, you know, and uh, but when you see goodness done in real time, oh, man, it's it's beautiful. Do you have jokes about about having COVID in your cell? I got a 10 minute joke <laughs> where Good. people are l l dying loud and no pun intended, but laughing hard. At my worst moment, and that's what I love about comedy. That's what it's about. Like, literally, as I'm dying or as I'm going through this in the hospital, I'm making mental notes. Like, if I make it, this is going to be funny. You know, and, uh, like, I can't wait till you hear it. Like, it's going to start my special. Nice. And it's just going to come out the box with it. And it's 10 minutes long. And when I say it crushes, it crush. You feel something. It makes you feel a certain way, but also you laugh. You know, um, it's, it's, I've been performing a lot at the cellar. And the thing I'm getting is, and you get this too, like I'm a, people feel bad for you when I start to joke. So you got to get them out of that. Oh, right. you know, because you don't want to hear that throughout. 
you want the because that stops laughter right you know because it's like if so, if a couple of people are on and then people go well why am i laughing is this supposed to be sad so i just write before i even tell the story i go look i'm about to tell an inspiring story it's about me almost dying from COVID, and don't worry you're looking at me uh the black dude makes it to the end of this movie you know <laughs> what up, i mean straight so up. that sets the tone where it's like look i'm here there's no reason for alls right you know what i mean i ain't got time for that i, I, don't, I don't and you kill the momentum when you oh yeah it's, okay. it's like you know i'm here right i survived <laughs> right you know so I got to kind of set that precedence, but in front of my crowd, I won't have to do that because they'll, they'll want to hear it. Just these random shows I'm doing, you know, with all different crowds, a lot of people don't know you. So that's great too, that I'm practicing in front of people that have no idea who I am and it's still working, you know? Yeah. I, well, I, I asked that question also because I just was watching uh, Donnell Rollins on the breakfast club. And he was saying how he, he doesn't joke about COVID because he had COVID. And I was like, what the, f and you know, even Charlemagne was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like you're, you're the king of like saying something too soon, but you know, it's like, it's like uh, anytime you tell a joke in the audience, people laugh at everything in the world until it affects them personally, yes. you know, and yes. then, well, that's not funny. You can't joke about that because that one personally affected me, you know, but sure, you can laugh about black people being monkeys, you know, <laughs> or yeah, whatever the fuck exactly. the, the, the no, joke is. But you know, but you know where, I've heard Darnell talk about, make, when COVID first came out, he, me and him got in a fight about it. A lot of fight, but we got into a little something like what was a that? discussion. What uh, was it? He said it was, so, you know what, honestly, I would tell you, but I forget, it was so dumb. He just made a really dumb statement. And was it before he had COVID or after he had COVID? It was before he had it. Exactly. It was before so, it. so this is what he's saying, since, since now that he's had it, and it affected him. Now he's not talking about COVID. Well, see, anymore. my thing is, but this is my style of comedy. I'm not an observational comedian. I talk about things going on in my life. Like, I would never make a joke for me. It's not my style. I would never make a, a broad joke about COVID. Because, uh, you know, close to 600 million, I mean, close to 600,000 people died from it. But I will make lots of jokes about me mm -hmm. almost dying. Because... Cause, but still, at the same time, some people get mad at me for making jokes about me. Like, I had a lady in the audience the other day, not mad. She goes, oh, literally said this, oh, you're being mean to yourself. <laughs> we got we to gotta stop this shit out here. Yeah, yeah. I was like, look, look. I, I was like, no, no. This is my, <laughs> you can't get mad at me for being mean to myself, to say, making jokes about myself. So I was like, but that's only happened once and I've done it like now probably 10, 15 times, but it's a thing where, uh, yeah, the whole cancel thing, the whole, that we need to move past that. And like, I would never joke outside the box on something because that's not my comedy. I just joke about me, my family and things that happen within my world. Like I would never do a joke about any tragedy for me. Right. Unless I was in it, you know? Mm, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, you're, you're a good person, man. Um, cause, who, <laughs> Cause who knows what what I might say, yo? Right. Yeah. Um, because I, I'm on that Chappelle, like sticks and stones, Bill Burr, Paper Tiger vibe. When it's like, man, whenever I do a special, I, I haven't done a special yet on purpose because I, like you said, you've been able to be in the gym and, and work yeah. on that stand up muscle. I've been on set most of the time and haven't really been. And then COVID happened, so I want to make sure I'm really able to tour and get my weight up before I, I film a special. But when I do, it's probably going to be called Fuck Your Feelings. Um, there you go. And I, there you go. Because but, I'm tired but of that's shit. you. Right. Well, well, even, but what I love about Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle is a very personal comedian, though. Mm -hmm. You know, because, I, you know, the thing about Dave Chappelle, and I could be wrong on this, but I, Dave Chappelle's, like, the way he writes what I see, because I've seen all the special, but it seems like he throws out the topic, you know, to get, oh, did you hear about this? Then he gives some details about it, puts himself in that situation, and then you get the joke. You'll, you'll always hear four layers of it. You know what I mean? It's kind of like when he talked about, um, God, I, I can't get a joke. 
Well, like he'll go, uh, what was the dude that punched that lady in the elevator? When he uh, talked to Ray Rice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he talked, did you hear about Ray Rice? Da, 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 da. And then he'll give some facts about it. And then he'll go, man, if I was, you know, then it's kind of like if I was in that situation. Mm -hmm. And then he tells a joke. So he always puts himself in the situation. He'll have jokes about. I would have punched her in the pussy. <laughs> that's what he said. Yeah. You know, well, like, like, like Dave Chappelle, the one about Michael Jackson, right? Mm -hmm. He goes, he's still catching cases. He tells a joke. He goes, and then somebody said something about Rihanna. And then he goes, well, and he's talking in his, as him. Well, what was what she say? You know, so it's kind of like he puts himself in the joke. So you're getting his opinion. Right. And he's not just describing what happened. He's putting himself into the world of every joke he says. Because he wants to give you his outlook. Right. Right. Uh, his take on that joke, too. He's not just giving you news and saying a punchline. He's putting himself if, oh, well, if I was in that, I would have done this. You right, because that's just what late night hosting is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not doing that. Yeah, for sure. Hey, you know, you know what I wanted to know? How did you get your start in in um, hosting? How did all oh, that man. start for you? I was a radio DJ in Miami, and Ted Harbor, Annie, uh, Tiffany, and Maureen, they're the casting directors. Ted Harbor was the president of E. Somehow they caught wind of me, and I just did radio, never did TV. And they liked my show. It was the number one afternoon show in Miami. And uh, how old were you at this time? I was still old. I was like, I didn't move to LA till I was like 32. Really? 33, yeah. That's yeah, I'm I old, man. I'm old. You look good. I, well, thank you. Lighting, <laughs> lots of it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so well, they you win it because you got the Korean and you got the black. So I mean, you know, you go Asian. You know, gracefully. black don't crack, Asian no raisin, <laughs> you know bro. What I'm saying you good to go. I'm 137 years old, <laughs> homie. You know how I roll. Niggas a vampire. <laughs> but yeah, I am a vampire. <laughs> Straight up vampire. But it's a thing where they hired me with no television experience because they wanted my vibe, my look, and the way I interview people. And with no TV experience, it kind of just I moved down here and it kind of popped off for so. For my first 12 years, I hosted entertainment news. And now that I look back, I wish I would have got into acting like 10 years ago. I wish I would have done. But, you know, it, it was something that, you know, I started comedy was my thing 10 years ago. So I started that 10 years ago. Nice. I was like, I love this. And I've really grown and excelled. And, you know, uh, I, I love it. And now it's at, because I feel like entertainment is entertainment. And now mm. I'm to the point where I'm established as a comedian and keep growing. Now I can jump into something else. And that's, uh, and that's, and that's acting, so. Do you write, uh, are you developing any projects based around you? Is that I, something that I've you sold, work on? I've sold two. One didn't go uh, because it wasn't what we, you know, what I'm learning about the industry if you don't write it, you don't, even if it's your story, you don't have control of it, really. You mm. know what I mean? Like, you're always waiting. Writers have all the control. Like, you're waiting on them, and you're walking on eggshells around them because they control everything, hmm. you know? So I'm, you know, I sold one to Fox about my life. It didn't go. The script wasn't really what we pitched. And I got one with Nickelodeon right now that they're, um, uh, they're bringing out soon. So, um, you know, it's about my kid life. So it's definitely, and I got a couple of ideas. So literally in the last three years, I've sold three shows, but they didn't, two of them didn't go. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. No, and, I, and I'm only asking that because when you, you keep, you know, bringing up acting and, uh, you know, like you already know, we comedians. So, uh, yeah, you got to make your own project. You too sometimes. Make it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. America's Got Talent. You yeah. did. I was so surprised to see you on America's mm -hmm. Got Talent. What? Let me, let me ask you. Let me ask you why. I knew why you were gonna, you surprised? I, I knew you was going to ask that. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I'm on the outside looking in, right? So to me, you're already Michael Yo. To me. You see what I'm saying? That's the, you know, and just like my fans, if they probably saw me on something, they're going to be like, why would Justin do that? He's already Justin Hyatt. Mm -hmm. 
So that's where my surprise came from. Now, I want to know what made you do it, though. Because I was transitioning out of host. Like, you remember when you said, I didn't even know you did comedy. Mm -hmm. Well, I got 82,000 people that follow me on Instagram. That's all the people that know I do comedy. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? I feel so, you. I feel you. So if I can get in front of six to eight million people and let them know I did comedy, that's why I did it. But, and I got a lot of hate. I'm not going to lie. Online, they were like, you're already famous. Why are you on the show? I was famous, and I'm saying that in quotes, because fame is different levels on who you talk. I was famous in entertainment news. Nobody knew I did comedy, really, unless you were a big fan and you came out to my shows. Right. So I was like, what's the easiest way for a lot of people to know you do stand up, <laughs> <Straight up. laughs> you know, and to get in front of Simon Cowell, because if he likes you, he could change your life. I was like, AGT, I got on the show, no problem, but I got COVID during the show. Uh, and um, then I was supposed to do a couple sets that we had planned and those got knocked down. And then I had to do a set that I wasn't really prepared to do. And I was dealing with COVID, like the after effects. I couldn't remember shit, Justin. Yeah. Literally, I called my doctor the day of the show. I go, I can't remember anything. And he goes, I'm hearing, and this was new still. It was only like three months old, four months old. He goes, yeah, that's what we're hearing, man. People just forgetting stuff. Any new material, I forget. But we had two other sets that didn't get approved for whatever reason. Uh, so, you know, I, I said I said bye on the show, but at least they got my story out. You know what I mean? Right. And I still get a lot of people that come out from AGT because they like the way they did my story. Nice. Um, how important do you feel it is for you to watch what you say for the sake of advertisers? I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't care because... Let me, let, now, I don't want to sound like I'm big, but I don't really talk like that anyway. Right. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, I know I can go on a million podcasts in a row and not say anything because I've been on the media side. I know what questions are coming. I know how they try, because I was that dude. Right. <laughs> you know, so. I, I used so to try I, to trap them. Yeah, I, I, I know all the traps. I know, but also I'm a dude that doesn't really say anything Unless it's about me. Like, I don't right. really talk about people unless it's about me. That's not my comedy, where some people are like, oh, this, that, that. I'll report on people, Straight but up. I'm not going to, like, talk about them, really. You know what I mean? And that's why I got out of entertainment news, too. Uh, the entertainment news I couldn't control is because you have to paint narratives that you don't really agree with sometimes. Mm. Like, like, if you were, you're Justin, let's say you were dating some celebrity, and I asked you a question and you said something about it and y'all broke up. We would bring that clip back and I go, well, looks like Justin did this, did that, you know, and I would have to paint it a certain way. And I got tired of that side of it, you know, because I just don't want it. It's not that I don't want anybody mad. It's just, I don't believe in that. Right. You know, it's like, look, they're adults, let them be, you know, right. but that's why I kind of had to move out of it too. How do you handle Dif have you had any difficult interviews? And if you did, how how do you handle and maneuver when you're when you're interviewing someone that that's coming across a little difficult? Well, I I, I don't deal with them. I, I I learned that early. Like I will cut an interview off. Like I don't care. Oh, you got four minutes. If they bad the first minute, I'm like, all right, I'm good. Then then they're like, what? what? I was like, oh no, I'm good. I got everything I needed. I know. Oh. Because then. I don't look like I'm trying. Right. It's just, they know, oh, he didn't deal with my BS. So I, I, I've done that. Like, I, I've told Tom Cruise before. I mean, he gives the best interviews, by the way. But Tom Cruise has this trick. You ask him a question, and he's so smart, because most reporters will go with it. But I interviewed him so much, we built a rapport at that time. I, I saw the mistake. I was like, how many questions do you get? How many questions? He said, man, I only got two questions in. What? It's like, didn't you have, like, Five minutes? Like, yeah. I go, how many questions do you get? You go, oh, I got like three. I have like 10 questions I need to get to. So after I interviewed, we were doing this junket. I interviewed him probably like in 10 weeks, maybe three or four times. I literally walked in the room. Because Tom, what he'll do is ask me a question, Justin. About anything. Ask me a question. I'm Tom Cruise. Uh, ask me a question. 
how do you keep your hair looking so nice? Oh my God, how do I keep my hair looking nice? Let me tell you, Justin, you know, I've had this hair all my life and um, you know, it took a while to try to find the right gel. But then I was like, why am I looking for gel when I have a stylist? So I went to the stylist, but we couldn't nail it with her. So she had to ask another friend. So he will drag one story out for three to four minutes. Mm. So, because most people won't cut him off. So literally to not, because he knows you always softball the first couple of questions to, because you, the third, fourth and fifth question is usually the money uh, question. Gotcha, gotcha. He's like, if I don't have to get to those, right. like he's so smart. So I walked in, he did, he tried to, he never got away with it. I remember my last time when they needed stuff from him. I had 10 questions. I said, I said, I said, I said, Tom, I got eight minutes. I got 10 questions. Please don't take long on the answer. I told him that and he started <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Straight up. He started, he started laughing. I, and I was like, hey, this is a rapid fire. Pretend they rapid fire, Tom. Let's go. Let's go. And, I, and he died laughing because he knows I know. You know, so I started getting to that level. Like with The Rock, I'm like that. With Kevin Hart, I'm like that. So being around that all the time, I was like, oh, you know what? I know how to deal with them. Comedy, it's all entertainment, you know? So it's kind of like if I can deal with these people like this, I can deal with them in acting. I can deal with them in comedy. It just gave me great confidence, like being on stage on a killer show with like a Bill Burr, like a, all these killers at the comedy store. And then interviewing face-to-face -face with Tom Hanks, with Tom Cruise, and, just, and getting everything you needed from them just gives you this confidence that you can do anything. Straight up. And that's where I am in my life right now. I can do anything. And like I told you, and I'm telling you again, I've seen this movie. I'm going to be selling out auditoriums. I'm going to be in movies. I'm going to be on TV. I started late, but Morgan Freeman started at 50 and started killing it. So, look, it's going to happen. I've seen it. I've seen it. Seen hey, man. Justin. Hey, man. You heard what he said, man. This has been Michael. Yo, like I said, this is Urban Legends Podcast. I created this uh, to celebrate people I consider living legends and making legendary Oh, movies. man. Hey. You're giving roses, man. You're giving roses, and I appreciate it. Hey, man. You're a king, bro. Uh, I wish you nothing but continued success. It's going to happen. Everything, like I said, you said that you that you want. Hey, will it work it and, and see it to fruition, bro? It's gonna happen, bro. So yeah, man, and I appreciate, I appreciate you, Justin. You already uh, tearing stuff up, and I can't wait to see your projects. And tell Lee he need a new profile picture. What that that is the worst picture. Oh, I told him. Oh, you can wait, see it on wait, your it's side. Still, it's still it's yeah. still popping wait. up. He's like this. He's like this. I know it's so <laughs> stupid, bro. It's so stupid. He's in a suit. He's in a. Look. I just threw so I'll change the goddamn picture. Wait, 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 what are you it. trying to do, Lee? What are you trying to do, Lee? Yo, I told him he's so used to working in corporate America and all of that, like let me fit in type shit. I'm like, yo, you work with me. Cut the shit, bro. Be your yeah, natural, man. authentic self, man. Nobody got time. I told him that picture was yeah. stupid. <laughs> yeah, I don't know are you, who are you trying to work for Macy's or something like that. I don't I, even know. I, I used I used to be a Walmart manager. So right, <laughs> <laughs> that's, and, and, that's hilarious. That's and his heart. Instagram picture is like that too. I mean, oh man, you got to change. Like I like what you're wearing now. Exactly. You know? yeah. But listen, you look like he, a thinner version of Rick Ross. You know, it's great. <laughs> right. He got all these other pictures on his Instagram that women like, 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 and then he throw up these fucking, I hope somebody will hire me pictures. He don't right? think his job is going to last long. That's why. That's why I'm, <laughs> it's just been there. I, I wasn't focusing on changing. I'm going to change it this weekend. Goddamn it. All right, weekend. you better. Next time I'm on, there better be a different picture. Yeah, th thank you, Mike. Are we going to make the whole pot? There it is again. Look at that. That's terrible. <laughs> And what you staring at in that bed? What what are you looking at? I don't even understand. Like what you looking off at? Like, hey Lee, like, put the picture up so people can see. Can is you, that? Can hey, you, no, I ain't got it on my desktop. I don't know how to. Oh, hold on, hold you, on. you can put it in and edit. Yeah, I put it let it me in tell later. you something. Yeah, let me tell yeah. you something. Are you staring at the Walmart you used to run in that picture? <laughs> is that what you? Like? Yeah, it probably is. <laughs> probably is. Yeah, I'm gonna have to throw that picture up in the edit in the final. Yeah. Uh, so people can see the foolishness that I have to look at all the time. But but Justin, I want to say, man, uh, I, I love you like a brother, and I can't wait to see what you do. And if you do get a project, you better put me in it because I'm coming after you if you don't. Hey, straight I'm just, up, I'm gonna bust your little ass if I'm not <laughs> in your project. Hey, I got you, Michael. I love you too, man. And we'll do, bro. I got you. All right, all right, homie. We'll talk soon. All right, peace. <laughs> No, I ain't no Jay-Z. 
but you still get a J. Shooting at niggas like that nigga Clay. Invested in myself and doubled up my pay. 